Good morning, Kurt. I've got a question for you today related to leadership in the online environment. And I'm wondering if you can describe what a, a challenge might be for a new leader stepping into this new online learning space. You know, in the past we said the challenges were training, right? Awareness. We've gone from those steps and levels, the awareness levels, you know, the first stage, and then we have resistance level, and then we've been stuck in that for a while. Now we're in the understanding and use levels, and soon the sharing and advocacy side of the fence. Um, now that we've shifted from resistance into doing things, what are you working with in terms of contents? Among the plethora of contents out there today are uh, available resources from other universities, other people, other places, making sense of what's available, first of all and trying to get faculty and other administrators and consumers of that content to realize that you don't need to use all of it. You don't need gigabytes of data or, or mm. trillions of content pages. You need to find 20 good websites of resources to use in any discipline, whether it's physics or chemistry or math. You find 20, 25, that's more than enough to supplement or blend in one's classroom settings. So that's the first challenge within this open ed movement is to get people's mindsets around the fact that it takes one hour to sit down in a closet with a flashlight to identify 20 things. You can do that. If you can spend one hour, better yet two hours, mm. all alone in a closet with your laptop exploring and then sharing with the other faculty members and coming to an agreement about what's high quality, you'll address this issue of quality, you see, right away. There's only four questions that come, keep coming at us, quality, copyright, plagiarism, and assessment. Quality is the stickiest one of the four, actually. We can address assessment and plagiarism to some degrees for other easily. Uh, so the, the sticking point it ends up being quality of contents. But the, the problem with that is there's such a wide spectrum of materials that are in front of us. Second aspect of this OER side of this is do we assess students or both informal and formal learners for what they've learned from this open ed space? You see, it might not be about credentialing people utilizing open ed resources. These open ed resources might in fact be a transitionary stage for someone's life mm -hmm. where they've moved from being our grocery store manager and we've been stuck in an accident of some kind, laid up in a hospital. Well, there's a case of a guy in a hang gliding accident, mm -hmm. took 20 years off of college, was accessing open ed resources from the hospital bed, wow. got returned on to college, and re-enrolled in Yale mm -hmm. or wherever to get his English degree. Mm -hmm. Then the focus is too often, again, either it's the massive stuff out there, get in your mind, wait, you know, just um, uh, befuddled by all the uh, possibilities. And the second is just to think about learning from this content in a traditional fashion. Again, it might be a bridging mechanism. It might be an awareness mechanism. These contents can, in fact, change people's lives without it, in fact, being a transcript uh, item, okay? So in addition to wrapping on what's available at high quality and the fact that there are new forms of learning taking place from these contents, the third is to make people to make people just simply aware of what's out there and um, showcasing some best practices on the use of these open educational resources and to think about long term what's going to happen in the coming years and decade or decades in terms of these contents being translated into other languages and other you know, contents from other countries being translated into English if you're in an English-speaking country. Mm -hmm. So there's that aspect of all of this. Uh, and maybe get capturing some life histories of people, you know, uh, that have utilized them and how they've moved forward within their respective lives as a result of them. And maybe finding one thing, your university, your department, your unit might be able to showcase in terms of open ed resources mm -hmm. so, so that you can dip your toes in the water of all of this instead of thinking about creating a whole program mm -hmm. or you know restructuring your entire program because of this free content. Instead think about what's one class or piece of a module that you can provide that will in, in effect market your, your institution, your program, your department so that people can um, feel good about themselves learning from that but also say, oh, what's the next step? What can I do beyond that? 
mm. you see, and come back into school and maybe from a blended format, maybe fully online, maybe face to face. So how do you transition people from these? Um, and I've written a pa paper on 30 ways to um, think about open ed resources, 10 from a student point of view of why to use, 10 from an instructor uh, in terms of how to use, and 10 from an institutional standpoint. And it's an ed, uh, e-learning magazine from a couple of years ago. 30 reasons on why to use open ed resources. Maybe I'll you know, add that resource, that would be a great link. Yeah, be yeah. a way to start and then to have a conversation around those 30. That would be the other thing people should do. Here's ideas, David Wiley right. has similar things, yeah. and here's what Bonks, here's what other people say, yeah. and then start the conversation. You won't believe what's possible by starting there. Yeah. Good luck. Good. Good, thank you so much.